Hello everyone and welcome to the SimScale webinar in collaboration with Atkins. Today, it's all about optimization of building designs and cities for the planet and the people by using simulation in the cloud. I'm your host and moderator for today's session, Yusuf Murat, and I'm a product marketing engineer here at SimScale. It's really a pleasure to host today's webinar. I, I can already see many attendees in today's session, so that's really great to see. Um, let me kick things off by introducing our two guest speakers for today's session, namely Augusta Stanitsa and Ruth Heinz. Augusta is a qualified architect working with Atkins Building Design Research and Innovation Team, focusing on environmental design and digital innovation. Her expertise involves exploring how design impacts human experiences and how no novel approaches could be leveraged in forming decision-making processes. Ruth Heinz is an associate design researcher with Atkins Building Design Research and Innovation Team. She has a background in architecture and her work focuses on well-being in the built environment using applied research to better understand how buildings shape people's experience. She has experience working on a diverse range of design projects and leads the development and application of Atkins Human-Centered Design Toolkit. Last but not least, I'm also happy to be joined by my colleague Richard söcke schuler today. With a background in applied mathematics and mechanical engineering, Richard is a valuable member of the product management team here at SimScale. He and his team constantly try and make SimScale a better fit for every engineer in the world. Just as a small side note, at the end of this webinar, we will have some time to cover all your questions in a dedicated 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. So please, if you have any questions about the webinar itself, Atkins or even SimScale, please put them in the chat or little Q&A box, and we will make sure to take them one by one at the end. So ladies and gentlemen, today I already mentioned it's all about human-centric design, which is the holistic approach to the design of spaces and cities that accounts for occupant health and well-being microclimate and also long-term adaptations to our changing climate and extreme weather events. But before we jump into the nitty-gritty of human-centric design and how Atkins actually leverage cloud-native design and simulation tools to develop an ecosystem around those topics, let me briefly introduce SimScale to you. So we see many engineers and designers new to SimScale who are curious to learn what we are all about. SimScale's mission is basically that we are committed to making engineering simulation more accessible, whether that's thermal, structural, or fluid simulations, to other industries who couldn't afford simulation so far. That also includes PwC. We strive to introduce digital prototyping into any R&D cycle and throughout the whole R&D process. And by using SimScale, you can explore the full design space with the desired accuracy and reduce trial and error that comes with physical prototyping and investigate so-called what-if scenarios very easily. So to summarize, we are focused on delivering computational resources that scale up on demand, we offer streamlined simulation workflows, and offer modern sharing and collaboration features. And we would like for engineers and designers to be able to simulate early, simulate more, and especially simulate now in one single SaaS application, helping you from the beginning to the end as basically one complete solution and leveraging the cloud for high optimization needs. Our mantra, you come with your CAD model and leave with a design decision. It's really that simple. So I already mentioned the first two points. And today we also want to talk about um, apps that predict the universal thermal comfort index, short UTCI, predict energy use, but also carbon savings over the lifetime of buildings and structures. And these apps have been built by leveraging the API of SimScale. You will also see how cloud native engineering simulation is used to create multiple design tools. You will listen to our uh, both of our experts and um, how they applied these design tools on live projects and as promised you can ask all your questions in the dedicated Q&A session but first and foremost you will also learn how to get started with simulation and with that I now hand over to my colleague Richard. Richard the stage is yours. Thanks Yusuf for the introduction. So um, I want to quickly introduce you to, to some of the um, principles behind SimScale and how we, we deal with microclimate studies, uh, what the problems are that you were facing or many of our customers were facing in the past with traditional CE tools, and how we overcome these obstacles with the solutions that we provide with SimScale. So first of all, if you look at the side-by-side -side comparison of traditional CE tools on the left and SimScale on the right, we see three main barriers that we have identified within SimScale. Why simulation is not as widely used as it could be for all the people that could benefit from simulation technologies. So first of all, we see that simulation, traditional simulation tools require HPC hardware resources to be really 
um, executed on a high resolution level. Um, this means HPC hardware needs to be bought and it also needs to be maintained, right? Everyone knows Moore's law and that computing power is increasing year by year at a rapid speed. That means that also HPC resources with, uh, will de decrease in value over a year and need to be updated. With SimScale, on the other hand, we have no specific hardware requirements. We're a completely cloud-based tool and all your computations, the heavy lifting uh, is done on the cloud. So your local computing processors are free to do the normal tasks that you anyways would do and you're not blocked by running simulations. Additionally, traditional simulation tools require high fixed cost early in the process before you see the ROI of simulation. Um, there's not only the fixed cost on the hardware side, but also on the simulation software expenses. Um, SimScale provides a very cost efficient business model where your cost scales as well with your needs and the uh, return on investment that you get. And last but not least, the traditional CE tools have been around since decades, meanwhile, right? So the, since the 70s, the concept of computer engineering, uh, computer aided engineering and simulation is well known. But still, as of today, only a very small percentage of engineers actually use the simulation. And the problem is that traditional tools are meant for experts. So that you need to have a special education to be able to use these tools efficiently and correctly. With SimScale, we have tackled this know-how barrier by many different aspects. And we have built our tool from the ground up to be user-friendly. So, all our workflows that we enable with SimScale have a very intuitive and easy to use interface. And additionally, what comes as a benefit on top of the cloud is that we enable seamless collaboration. That's specifically useful in the AC industry where you have multiple inter interdisciplinary teams working together on one design project. So with SimScale, you can share the projects across all different stakeholders with a single click of a button. Additionally, uh, being cloud-based, we offer an in-product support. So we have a chat functionality within the tool where you can reach directly our support people, post questions on a specific project, and directly share it with the support. But this way, you get instant answers to your questions and don't, don't need to dig out um, long pages of documentation or file a Report, uh, support request and wait maybe for days to get a response. Besides the ground technology that we deliver with SimScale being cloud-based and being accessible simply by a web browser, we have also technology benefits on the actual solver level and the implementation that we have within SimScale. First of all, the microclimate analysis that you can do with SimScale, specifically the pedestrian wind comfort, is based on a solver technology, which can handle robust, robustly any kind of complex geometry. Um, typically for architectural models, they are very detailed. They are not very clean. They are not made for simulation. They are made for the design purposes. Uh, with SimScale, there is no CAD cleanup mandatory prior to analyzing your wind on the specific side. So you can simply take the model as it is, upload to SimScale, and run a wind, wind comfort study on the side. In addition to that, <clears throat> we have made sure that everyone who needs to run uh, pedestrian wind comfort analysis can actually use it efficiently and can have the know-how that is needed to run these studies accurately. So we have made sure that we put the best practices from many different guidelines into the tool itself. For example, the sizing of the virtual wind tunnel, um, inputting the wind data, um, and so on. All of this is pretty much automated within the workflow. There's very little know-how needed to actually run the simulation. On the other hand, for more expert users, we always provide more detailed settings when you need to, to actually modify all the little details and have a more customized approach. That is as well possible. Last but not least, the simulation needs to be accurate, right? There's not much value in running simulations easily and, uh, uh, and fast. You need to be sure that your design decisions 
that you're making out of the simulation results are based on a solid uh, foundation. That's why we made, made sure that all the simulation types that we um, release with SimScale have a solid foundation of validation cases that we have run through. So this is one example here that you see on the right side, um, a traditional example for urban wind from the Architectural Institute of Japan, where we compared our results against experimental wind tunnel studies. And finally, the solar technology we are using um, with SimScale on the pedestrian comfort analysis is extremely fast. It is natively built for GPU architecture. That means it's massively parallel and it can turn around architectural design, wind analysis within a couple minutes or hours. The example here on the right that you see is uh, a pedestrian wind comfort study run on eight different wind directions. Uh, and in addition to also be solved for the statistical analysis to output the actual pedestrian wind comfort uh, statistics, is, um, was run on 69 million cells and took overall a little more than one and a half hours for the total turnaround time. This includes meshing, all eight directions, and the result processing. Now, that's maybe a little bit of an overload visually here, but what, what we want to um, show is that in addition to the streamlined workflows that you have already predefined within SimScale, with our API, our programming interface, you can enable much more workflows that would fit exactly the use case of your organization. So with the API, you can integrate the SimScale solver technology, the cloud-based solution approach into your workflows that you have already locally at hand, but you wouldn't want to extend them to a more powerful um, computational backend. So what we can do with the API and what we are seeing also today with the example from Atkins is we can use the technology of SimScale and incorporate it directly inside the tools where the designer, the architect, the engineer would need them, right? So if you're using Grasshopper or Rhino, you can integrate a plugin to use SimScale directly from there. There's no need to leave your design environment to do high fidelity CFD simulations. And it also enables a family of additional simulations, right? So you can do parametric sweep, sensitivity analysis, shape optimization, all of this directly while using the API and having the computational backend of SimScale. Now, two quick examples of how the API could be used and has been used by customers and partners. What we're seeing here is an example of um, a city model uh, from Boston, where the, result, the actual data source was uh, in a GIST model in uh, ArcGIS Online. Um, the geometry was exported to SimScale. We have run the pedestrian wind comfort analysis here, also in uh, eight different directions and the resulting uh, pedestrian comfort as well as the individual directional uh, wind results were uploaded again to ArcGIS Online. So in this case, we could enable a huge audience to just view the local wind effects around the new development uh, inside the GIS tool, not using SimScale, but just directly there where they need to see the result and also get together maybe additional um, results from different fields um, that would in the end make an informed design decision by taking into account all the different aspects of the design. Another example that I'm showing here in a, in a video is an integration that was made by uh, our customer Thornton Massetti. So they developed a tool which is um, a plugin that is natively integrated into Rhino. And with this plugin, um, what, what they could do is basically set up the complete wind study, might be a pedestrian wind comfort study or a single direction wind load analysis directly within Grasshopper. So a designer, architect can just within Grasshopper define all the required um, input properties. The input can be customized to the specific use case 
that in this case uh, Function SETI would have. And with the click directly here, the whole setup would be sent to SimScale, would be solved, and the results in the end um, would be imported back into Rhino and be visualized there. So this is a very good example to show how SimScale can extend traditional tools that were used mainly for, for design and have a very powerful computational backend that can be attached to it and is integrated seamlessly into the design process. Okay, um, with this, I'll hand over to Ruth. Great, thank you. Um, hopefully everybody can see my screen okay now, um, but do interrupt me if you can't. Um, my name is Ruth and I'm going to talk through a little bit of background to our human-centred um, design approach and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Augusta um, who's going to talk through some of our um, recent project examples in a little bit more detail. Um, so myself and Augusta, we work within Atkins Building Design Practice. We're a multidisciplinary design practice. Um, we have colleagues working across building services, architecture, master planning, uh, building structures. And we have a dedicated research and innovation team um, that's also multidisciplinary um, and brings in lots of other specialisms, uh, specialisms and expertise across specific areas. Um, so today we'll be drawing on a couple of those around human-centered design and research and digital innovation. We'll also be joined by our colleague Sukmit, uh, who is our digital solutions lead. Um, he's going to join us at the end for Q&A um, and he is really focused on bringing all of our digital tools together and uh, making sure that they're connected and that they're integrated into the design processes across our teams. So when we talk about um, human-centered design, uh, for um, Atkins Building Design, really this is our approach to um, ensuring that we're always putting people at the center of our design processes. And more than that, it's also about looking at how we can use evidence and research to really quantify the impact of the built environment on people and understand you know, what the specific factors are that, um, that we can look at to improve the experience and comfort of people in the built environment. Um, and so there's a huge range of different factors that um, will influence people's experience and their health and well-being in the built environment. Um, this is a great um, diagram from the World Health Organization that really shows those layers of impact um, when we think about um, people and how their uh, general environment, how the cities and neighborhoods around them is influencing their day-to-day -day activities. Um, their comfort and their well-being. So everything from buildings um, and streets, the roads, um, the parks, the kind of natural habitats that might exist, um, as well as those kind of more um, uh, intangible aspects, things like social capital um, or the different activities that are happening in our streets. Um, there's a whole range of different um, interconnected systems here and it's really important for us as designers to understand what they are and how they might impact on, on people. Um, today we'll be specifically talking about the urban climate in this context um, and really thinking about you know, how do we um, think about and understand all of the different elements of the urban environment, how they interact with each other and again how that will then influence the people that are uh, living and working within them. Um, so thinking about things like the urban heat island effect, um, building performance within um, urban environments, the impact potentially of, of green spaces or their lack thereof, and how all of these different um, elements uh, interplay with each other um, and interact. And so to help us um, understand this and to map out the ways in which we can quantify that or build tools to help us to understand um, specific aspects in more detail, we've developed our human-centered design framework. And this is really quite, um, uh, I guess, a kind of simple diagram showing the nine factors that we have defined that uh, we can map from the built environment to a person's physiological or psychological well-being. So things like light and air quality, all the way through to things like um, the flexibility of space. Uh, does that space support interaction between different groups of people? Um, is there a connection to nature? Um, you know, what's the, the sound um, experience in those spaces as well? 
Um, and so we use this in lots of different ways um, to help us define the different tools that we might need to develop, um, but also think about how we can use different tools to understand the relationship between some of these factors as well. And so just two examples um, here are thermal comfort and daylight. Um, so in the work that we do in the research innovation team, we're always looking at new research um, that we can bring into our understanding of, of how the built environment is performing. Um, so we can, you know, kind of take in some of the, um, the research from other uh, professions as well from um, the healthcare sector and from um, psychology departments um, that really have found that there's you know specific impacts on people um, in terms of um, thermal comfort and daylight um, and these these impacts happen in lots of different ways so it's not just the physical way that we respond to these different parameters but there's a psychological and sometimes a biological response to these as well. But then, of course, the most important thing for us is how do we then bring that information and that research into the way that we design and the information that we're helping to provide to our design teams and help them in that decision making process. So being able to um, identify the specific metrics that we can use that connect those building elements to the impact on people. And these are just a few examples um, that we'll be discussing today. Um, and I'm going to hand over on that note to my colleague, Augusta, who's going to talk through a couple of examples um, with that more specifically. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen as well. Um, so in the slide, you can see two examples of metrics. So the one on the left, uh, we can call it as a simple metric and it's named daylight factor. So for those who don't know, daylight factor is the ratio of the light level achieved inside a structure to the light level outside the structure. So as an example, so if the guidance says that a building should achieve a minimum of 2% average daylight factor. So the daylight factor metric is used to ensure that adequate daylight is provided to building occupants that can support both their tasks but also well-being. However, this metric doesn't take into account geographical location or time. Therefore, it can be used to inform our um, understanding about the level of lighting conditions internally in a building. However, they cannot, it cannot inform the design as to how it will perform throughout the period of a year or in different orientations. Therefore, there is a need to, to look at more complex metrics to help designers take these more informed decisions. As an example is what you can see on the other side, which is the climate based modeling. And more specifically, you can see here two metrics, daylight autonomy and useful daylight index. Again, um, for those who don't know, daylight autonomy is a measure of how often a minimum work plane illuminance threshold can be maintained by just daylight alone is usually expressed as the percentage of occupied time during the year when this minimum threshold can be maintained. So useful daylight index now represents the indoor illumination distribution of uh, for a whole year as a function of outdoor time, varying sky and sun conditions. So the uh, useful daylight index uh, provides information about useful daylight in illuminance, but also on the propensity for excessive levels of daylight that can be associated with uh, well-being factors such as glare, occupant discomfort or uh, building performance such as unwanted solar gains. So climate-based modeling delivers predictions of absolute quantities such as illuminance that are dependent on the location and the building orientation in addition to the building's composition and configuration and they can also be linked directly to well-being and occupant comfort conditions. So now that we achieved a kind of a distinction about what simple and complex metric could look like, I'm going to talk about the workflow that we usually undertake for a specific for, for diverse projects. And this usually starts with the analysis via simulation software of the baseline scenario. And this baseline scenario could be either an existing scenario or a first design proposal. And then it's followed by the visualization of the results by diverse means and leading towards the interpretation of the results into clear design guidelines that can be communicated to the design team. That way, we ensure that uh, the practical application of the findings into the design proposal can be done in a clear and concise way. So then after the design team implements these strategies, a second run of this workflow can take place concluded with evidence as to how hotspots have been eliminated or issues have been resolved. 
However, these workflows can have increased complexity and the first steps of analysis and visualization could actually look like that. So the metrics of assessing our design are, become, are becoming more complex in an attempt for us to better understand how these designs impact human perception. At the same time, technology is constantly improving and adapting, offering better solutions to deal with the complexity. So this is where we started. We started with these task-based scripts and these one-to-one -one solutions. However, the complexity of the solutions and the need for more people to have access to such information led us to seek to more sophisticated solutions where we would progress from these one-to-one -one relationships to the many-to-many -many ones. So having said that, we adopted cloud-based solutions such as SimScale, and that allowed multiple users analyzing their designs, uh, look at the individual metrics in isolation, but also interrelate these metrics, assess them as a coupled system that helped them to understand more complex information and how this could affect their developments and human perception. So that led us to the creation of our internal tools ecosystem in which we linked our bespoke internally developed tools where you can see at the top of this graph and this span from environmental analysis to building performance to uh, building information modeling techniques uh, and then we uh, link that back to existing solutions such as the SimScale platform and a range of other data sets that enabled us to connect from one tool to another in a seamless way, allowing very complex workflows to take place. So these connections enables us to have this common language of communication via this framework, um, but it also helps us to create these links between all the softwares, analysis, metrics, data, and all of this information that exists. So that way, we enabled our designers to have access to the design data across the project lifecycle, and that leads to more informed decision making, but at the same time enables a group of designers to work together. Finally, uh, you can say that this can almost be a plug and play of these tools, and that can help into uh, a more efficient project delivery and, and have a bespoke analysis solution that is best suited to the needs of each project. So we would like to show you some practical examples of these metrics and approaches that we discussed. And therefore, we have a couple of previous projects where we utilize different metrics for different scales um, and we responded to specific client changes, challenges. So uh, this one, it's part of KSA's vision 2030. It's a concept design stage for the development of um, the master plan for a new tourism and entertainment mega project in the outskirts of Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. So Diria Gate is a new destination in Riyadh and its role is to preserve and celebrate the historic district of Al Riyadh, the first Saudi capital, and the scheme complements the Al Turaif Heritage City World Heritage Site. So Diria Gate will be a mixed use project over an area of seven square kilometer. And the area is notable for its use of vernacular architecture leading to um, kind of a much finer urban grain, smaller plots, narrower, more organic street grid. So public realm is found here in the form of newly landscaped areas that connect between the various heritage sites. So aim of the study was to create sustainable living conditions and develop strategies to mitigate urban heat stress by the assessment of the microclimate conditions. The key area of focus was Diria Square, which is what you see at, in your screen at the moment, and is located within the heart of the scheme. So a range of different metrics were included, aiming to understand how the design proposal was performing in terms of microclimatic conditions. So this is an example of the metrics that we used. Um, we looked at wind patterns for the design of a shopping area that looks towards the square. The client wanted to ensure the increased time spent in external spaces and identify the location for different activities for that square. So working with SimScale, we looked at annual wind speed, speed and comfort at pedestrian level uh, to better understand the performance of the space on an annual basis. So we looked at transient wind speed and translation of those speeds into activities with the use of Lawson criteria. So the Lawson LDDC criteria, uh, for those who don't know, is um, the most famous criteria of assessing wind comfort levels. 
and is generally applied in several city scale development standards and guidelines. So utilizing these metrics helped us to identify areas where stronger speeds occurred and areas where seeding activities could be supported. Simulations also supported the application of LEED and MOSLEDOM certificates to help in a more efficient site operations for the project lifespan. So the second project is the Barbican Centre. Again, for those who don't have experience of London, um, this is a performing arts centre in the Barbican Estate uh, of the City of London, and it's the largest of its kind in Europe. So in this centre, there are a lot of, um, it hosts classical and contemporary music concerts, it has theatre performances, film screenings, art exhibitions, it has libraries, um, restaurants and so on. So initial plans for the Barbican Centre were drafted back in the 1950s, uh, but more extensive designs were later produced and the centre was eventually opened in 1982. So the Barbican complex is an example of British brutalist architecture and is currently a grade two listed building. So the focus of this study was the Barbican podium uh, because this offered the opportunity to prevent further damage from the effects of climate change uh, through the reshaping of the public realm and the expansion of the biodiverse planting areas. So aligned to the City of London's Corporation Climate Action Strategy, we contributed to better understand the human experience in the public realm and reduce the negative microclimate effects which pose serious risks in health and well-being. So the City of London, in collaboration with Atkins design team, um, undertook the second phase of the essential repair and refurbishment project of several areas of the podium decking and public realm at the Barbican Estate. So the repair uh, and refurbishment project is uh, a major opportunity that can allow us to explore potential improvements to the form, the function and the experience of the podium landscape, enabling this icon of urban form to remain enjoyable and climate resilience long into the future. So understanding the baseline microclimatic conditions on the podium and explore how various redesign options could improve these conditions can play an important role in delivering environmentally sensitive, comfortable landscape. So once again, we looked at wind speed patterns with the use of the SimScale platform, and we assessed um, its direction individually to better understand comfortable and uncomfortable wind directions. So we looked at the strongest winds, and as you can see from the wind rows, these are coming mainly from the south. And more specifically, we extracted these results for the purposes of this presentation. And you can see here the strongest directions and winds patterns coming from 270 and 240 degrees. So these types of analysis allow the designer to understand the impact of the microclimatic conditions on human perception and identify areas where human comfort is likely to be compromised or even the opposite, where wind patterns can be beneficial for the user. We also started looking at other metrics, that, for example, daily solar radiation analysis. We looked at that in a period of um, the year, in um, summer periods, um, winter periods, but also daily rates uh, such as the equinox and solstice. And we employed also other platforms and tools to look at thermal comfort indices. So thermal comfort indices help capturing thermal comfort in a quantitative way, meaning that we can translate all the different metrics that influence human perception into perceived temperatures. Therefore, it helps us to understand what people feel. So there are several thermal comfort indices, such as an example, predictive mean vote or universal thermal comfort index that you heard in the beginning of this presentation. But the one that you can see here is called physiological equivalent temperature, often referred to as PET. And this specific metric helps us to evaluate external thermal comfort by evaluating the thermal comfort, uh, sorry, the thermal component according to the physiology of the human body. So the uniqueness of this index is that it combines weather, the impacts of green infrastructure and thermophysiological parameters such as clothing and human activities to understand what people feel. So to sum up, um, general microclimate environmental assessments in urban environments are usually assessing these diverse parameters separately. 
our approach supports a more holistic view of the climate system to create the sustainable living conditions in constantly changing environment. So we developed this advanced methodology which draws on a broad range of frameworks, include a wide range of unique metrics, and this allows for the analysis of the design impacts on the local environment and help us to mitigate factors found in external environment, as an example, the urban heat stress. So for this specific project, we developed this workflow empowered by the SimScale API. And this workflow starts with the model as an input. The analysis is done in the SimScale cloud-based platform by an API call. And then the results are sent back to the model to be overlaid with a range of other data sets, metrics, and analyzed and visualized. So that enables the visibility of this information from multiple users. Well, at the same time, it helps in combining these different metrics, overviewing more complex ones, and better assess the impact of the macro climate on human perception in general. So this is an example um, where we looked at the, we took the wind speed information from the SimScale platform. We looked at the other individual metrics such as the solar radiation, and then we combined and visualized them into these more complex metrics such as the universal thermal comfort index. So that way you can visualize separately the metrics, but you can also review the assessment to better identify the factors contributed to thermal discomfort. So such information can then be fed back to the design teams or to another platform, which is part of our tools ecosystem. And then you can follow a new type of analysis to inform other aspects of the design. So with that, I'm going to conclude and then I'm gonna uh, give this back to, to Youssef and invite the rest of the team to the Q&A session. And we'll now head over to the Q&A session. And I can see a couple of questions coming in already. The first one being, is your tool available to third parties or only internal to Atkins? And whoever wants to answer it can go first. I can pass that to Souk um, to give us an answer. Thanks, Augusta. Um, yeah, so at the moment, it is just for internal Atkins use. Um, but we are looking at how we could further some of the work we are doing and, and share that with the wider community as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Another question would be, what are the requirements for the CAT model in order to complete microclimate studies? Which CAT formats are allowed and what's the requirement on the CAT quality? Do I need to do any closed surfaces and a clean model? I think Richard, that's something you could answer. Sure. Um, yeah, so basically we support, uh, first of all, um, from CAD format side, uh, all the major um, CAD formats that you would expect, uh, including uh, Rhino, Revit, uh, Parasolid, and others. Um, so virtually all the, the CAD tools should be supported. And regarding to the, to the quality requirements, <clears throat> as, as, I, as I previously uh, mentioned, the quality requirements uh, for SimScale to run uh, external wind studies are much lower than traditional uh, finite volume based solvers, for example. So there is no specific requirement on having non-overlapping non surfaces or having closed bodies or all these kind of things. Um, so that's not a problem. The solver is very robust, although obviously if you have a huge hole in, in a building surface uh, or a building facade, there will be air going in, right? So whatever makes sense like uh, physically if you would look at uh, the model that uh, there's no uh, big leaks in the in the terrain for example or in the buildings then it's also fine to be run for the external wind studies on some scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much Richard. Um, another question is are there any limitations on the model extension? Can I model a complete district? That's an interesting one. Yeah maybe I can answer from some scale side. Um, on these on these uh, analysis types, there's virtually no limit. So we have um, analyzed models that are more than 100 square kilometer large. Um, obviously, you, you cannot use it on a very on a, on a high level of resolution as you would, for example, need for for City of London standard, where you go to 30 centimeter cell size. Um, but you can go um, yeah several square kilometers uh, for sure. 
Uh, we, we support just from, from the size of the model, we, we can handle up to 200 million and more cells in these uh, GPU accelerated solvers. Okay, then I guess we'll jump to the next question. How do you incorporate the effects of climate change into your model? Do you have a specific source for expected climate conditions in, let's say, 2050 for any place in the world? Also very interesting one. I'm sorry, you Yusef, I, was, I, I thought I was on, um, I was talking, but I was on mute. Just to recap on the previous question, mm -hmm. um, we were we are using these types of analysis in different scales, coming from um, a very small scale to big master plans. And of course, there are limitations. And as uh, Richard talked about, um, some of them are linked to the to the sim scale uh, platform as well. Um, but some others are linked to, to the internal developed tools. But um, I wouldn't say that we have seen that as a problem to analyze bigger schemes. Because one of the examples I talked about today, um, Diregate, we analyzed other parts of the master plan and these extend into very, very big areas. Um, and then I can I can jump to the next question, if that's okay. Sure, go for it. Um, so yeah, so we, we looked at um, we use weather files that are um, issued uh, from um, from authorities for looking at uh, how the weather will evolve in 2050. Um, but also we collaborate closely to our internal climate change team and they can help us into defining the inputs into our model and look at this in, in more detail. I don't know, Ruth and Sook, if you want to add anything on that. Yeah, I'd just like to add that I think that's the opportunity that um, SimScale and using the API and cloud native apps has really brought to us in terms of our workflow is not only being able to run the analysis once and, and get a result, but actually be able to option there and explore at scale so that you know we can tweak and customize weather files working with our in-house experts, but we can also then take leverage from um, so the industry bodies and, and like I said, from other governance um, around what type of weather we should be trying to design for and, and trying to predict and incorporate in. So definitely a, a perk and a benefit of using the API and using cloud native solutions. Yeah, I'd just like to, I guess, kind of reiterate that as well. And in, in, I guess the kind of value of that kind of ability to optioneer um, because we're increasingly seeing um, you know, people wanting to explore those those different options and thinking more about, um, you know, not just the impact of a decision now, but what that impact might look like, um, you know, in 10 or 20 years. So, um, you know, kind of as Asuka saying, like being able to experiment and, and kind of work with, you know, both SimScale and our internal tools is um, it's just really valuable to that kind of experimentation process as well, which is obviously kind of an important part of any research innovation team. Excellent. Thank you so much for the extensive answer. We have a few more questions coming in. We have a couple of minutes left, so make sure to post your questions in the Q&A box. So another one would be, uh, hi, everyone. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. What was the feedback you received from clients? Sure. Um, I'll jump in and I'll let Augusta kind of pick up. But I think, um, just as I was saying, kind of before I touched on that, we have had really good feedback from clients, you know, because these are, you know, it's complex issues that we're trying to explore um, and being able to visualize, I think, the complexity of some of these things um, has been has been really valuable. Um, you know, being able to kind of show, um, you know, the, the, the different scales or, you know, kind of what impact might look like in terms of, you know, kind of um, human experience is a much more tangible thing to talk about. Um, so we've, we've had really kind of good feedback in terms of that. I don't know, Gusto, is there anything else you wanted to add into that? Uh, yeah, so I think that the key here is how you visualize this information and in some extent simplify. Uh, and I think this is something that we constantly work um, internally, but also with our clients. And we are looking at different types of visualization from 2D plans to 3D environments. I think um, in the initial slides of the presentation and part of the workflow, you could see like a 3D model and display of this information and uh, clients could interact actually with the different data sets overlaid and based on these um, workshops or presentation we get 
feedback and we further develop that. But as Ruth said, is is very complex information, and I think the visualization uh, is is key here. Great. Um, we have another interesting question coming in, which is how do you assess user satisfaction post occupancy? Open areas with little shading and little wind seems very uncomfortable and not very vernacular. Is the London criteria really suited here in Saudi Arabia, for instance? So uh, I can, yeah, go yeah, for go it. Ahead. With, no, you go. <laughs> Sorry. And um, so this is one of the uh, criteria that we looked at, but this was not the only one that we looked at, is one of the recognized ones, and that's why we wanted to understand better um, how we could translate this information, the wind speeds, into these kind of activities. But then we overlaid other criteria, and I've talked about how we import information with these simulations to lead and most of them certifications. So we follow the, the guidelines um, on these, these kind of certifications as well um, to better identify how we could respond to that specific climate. And also we uh, incorporate feedback from the client about how they aspire this space to be. Um, and yes, I don't know if that answers Ruth, if, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I guess just to, I guess, kind of clarify maybe that um, obviously the, the two projects that we showed are very different locations, very different climates. Um, and so we would be looking at a, a different um, you know, different outcomes that we're seeking for each of those and we would be using a combination of, of different metrics um, in addition to kind of what we have shown here um, because it is complicated and urban environments are complex and a lot of the time it's you know trying to understand how we can create um, comfortable spaces for a majority of the year but obviously you're not going to have you know full comfort outdoors all year round you know in any climate really there's always going to be challenges with that so again it's kind of looking at um you know what are the extremes over the year and, and kind of what are the thresholds that we might um change for those different climatic conditions as well thank you so much we i don't see any more questions coming in for free i'll give it a couple more seconds um in the meantime um if you have any or want to request a one-to-one -one demo, uh, you can do that by visiting our website, simscale.com, or contact us directly at sales at simscale.com. And for future webinars on this topic, uh, please visit simscale.com slash webinars minus workshops. Um, yeah, I think we can wrap it up at that point. Uh, thank you so much to the presenters, Augusta, Ruth, Richard, and also uh, Sukmit for taking the questions and giving excellent answers. Uh, and with that, I'll close the session. Thank you so much and see you in the next webinar. Bye-bye.